The Gokturks, mighty warriors of the Eurasian steppe belt, rulers of the first transcontinental steppe empire in history and the first Turkic people to officially call themselves Turk. Their ruling dynasty, the Arshina, started as blacksmith slaves in the Altai mountains. When their leader, Umin, put down a revolt in favor of his liege, the Khagan of the Ruran, he was denied further privileges, which prompted a rebellion of his own. Within less than a decade, Umin overthrew the yoke of the Ruran, became the new Khagan, and his brother Istemi, as well as Umin's sons Usuk and Mukan, expanded the new Turk Empire to Korea in the east and Kazakhstan in the west. They are known today as the Gök Turks, which literally can translate to Celestial Turks, Blue Turks, Original Turks, or Eastern Turks, all of which are correct descriptions of the Ashina dynasty. But there are a lot of mysteries surrounding these rulers of the steppe. One of those concerns the creation myth of the Ashina and, for that matter, the Turk people as a whole. The legend of Asin. As so often in history, wars between states or ethnic groups in Asia's late antiquity led to flight and displacement. South of the Altai Mountains, the later home of the Ashina, is the Taklamakan Desert, an inhospitable place to live. But on the northern ring near Gaochang, at the transition to the Altai, better living conditions prevailed. From the Tarim Basin to Gaochang, this belt was dotted with many oasis towns that were inhabited by Indo-European and Chinese, but also Hunnic people. It was of utmost importance within the framework of the ancient Silk Road and thus also of strategic importance for the many empires of East and Central Asia. In late antiquity, families that descended from the legendary Xiongnu Hans had say here. But in 439, Chinese dynasties began to expel these families. In one village, all family members were even killed by the invaders. All, except for a 10-year-old boy who managed to escape. However, the boy was injured and didn't get very far. That's when he came across a she-wolf who befriended him. The ruler of the invaders learned of this and ordered his soldiers to kill the boy as well as the she-wolf, but they both fled in an instant to a mountain north of the Gaochang region. She housed them at a cave surrounded by a plain with rich vegetation. The she-wolf fed the boy and watched him grow into a man. At some point, the two merged and she gave birth to ten little boys who then grew into strong men. In adulthood, these ten left the cave area and mingled with the surrounding villages. Each of them in turn had children and so an extended family of 700 grew up. They all bore the name Ashina in honor of their mother who was called Asena. Then, these people left the mountainous area and avenged their father and his family. This myth then became the fundament of the Gökturks and was passed on as a oral tradition from generation to generation. The symbol of the wolf has ever since been very present in Turkish literature and in certain political circles in Turkey by people who associate their cultural identity with the Gökturks, the first Turks who appeared on the world stage. Thus, the use of the so-called wolf sign is also very popular in Turkish society. While it has been identified as a fascist symbol by some in Europe, it is also being used by politicians who are not even part of the right-wing grey wolf community and perhaps instead part of the liberal or rather left-leaning political parties. If we take away the association of this wolf sign with the Grey Wolf organization, it is nothing more than a tribute to the Asana legend and perhaps to remind others of the origin of the Turkish identity and language. While the wolf sign as a hand gesture is mostly a creation of modern times, the wolf itself, as a sacred animal, has persisted throughout more than a millennia in Turkic societies. The Grey Wolf was also an important animal in the mythology of the neighboring Mongol people. Then again, the way Asena has been portrayed in Turkey is actually not correct. Not even her title of being Boskut, a grey wolf, is right. In fact, Asena was not a typical grey wolf at all, but a blue wolf, Gök Börü in Old Turkic. Blue because of her fur, which shimmered bluish when the boy saw her in moonlight. 
and blue because of her connection to get Tengri, the ruler of the eternal blue sky who, acting as an interventionist god in this case, had brought Asena to earth to save the boy and his people from extinction. So when someone says boss code instead of Gökböre, it could be because of convention. But you can also rest assured that they either do not see the connection between Asena and Tengri, and thereby Tengrism is a religion, or they do not want to see it. When the Ashena left the Altai Mountains, the legend of Asena turned into the legend of Elginikon. The protective mountain ranges, where the boy and the she-wolf had taken refuge, represented the only protection of the family from the enemies as they were hard to enter or cross by an entire army. A blacksmith named Bertigin, presumably one of the ten original sons of Asena, made a hammer with the help of which the men could smash the mountain range and clear the way. This opened the gate to the outside world. Agenikon would later become part of the Oz Turk myth. The Oz Turks were a group of 24 Turkic tribes who, after the fall of the Gök Turks in the east, fled to the Bactrian Soptian border region in West Asia. They settled near the Aral Sea and resided there for centuries, keeping their old Tengris faith, Turkic traditions, and customs, which they shared with the Gök Turks and basically all other Turkic peoples. The Seljuks, Ottomans and Ak and Karakoynlu claimed to be descendants of four of the mightiest Oz tribes. The Argenekon legend was also part of the Sajara i Tarakama, the genealogy of the Turkmens, a book written by Abu al Ghazi Bahadur, Khan of Kiva and his story. Finally! In any case, the Asena and Argenekon legends explained the mythical birth of the Turk. So the Turk was literally descended from a wolf and had a talent for forging metals from which weapons could be made. Of course, Turkic history goes back much further than to the creation of the Gökturk Empire, it is nonetheless an important part of Turkic historiography. For example, the special units of the Gökturks were called Ördü, meaning wolves. Moreover, the rulers of the Gökturks held annual ceremonies in the ancestors' cave somewhere in the Altai mountain range to commemorate the Agenikon legend. The flag of the Gökturk Empire was probably decorated by a wolf's head as well as the stele of Bugut, which shows a she-wolf suckling a child. Interestingly, the legend of Asena shows parallels with the origin stories of the Indo-Aryan Wusun who lived nearby and even with that of the Romans. The city of Rome came into being after the orphaned brothers Romulus and Remus were taken in and suckled by a she-wolf. The two grew up to be men and Romulus stamped out the city named after him. The wolf then played a not insignificant role in the collective consciousness of the Romans as a sacred national animal along with the eagle. For the Turks, of course, the wolf has played a particularly important role in cosmology ever since. Still. It is interesting how the she-wolf was revered or respected in other culture spheres outside of Asia. But while being a legend, it is based on a true and well-documented incident. Chinese annals tell us about a historical event that could explain the background of the legend. The last Hanuk princess in Gaocheng, named Wu Hui and Anzu, once fled north from an invading army and arrived in the Altai region, where they then resettled with their families. They became vassals of the Ruan. The Turks, as is well known, had later also been their vassals and coincidentally appear in the chronologies of Asia at the very time at the Altai in 1439 when the last Hans disappeared from Gaocheng. Hence the claim by Chinese scholars that the Gök Turks are the descendants of the Xiongnu or ancient Hans. As you can see, the history of the Gök Turks is shrouded in mystery. In fact, despite decades of intensive research, there are still many questions that remain unanswered. But aside from names or events that are missing or cannot be restored into modern Turkish, there are also questions that would be of interest for those who want to go a step further than many historians do. For example, how exactly did the Ashina build such a vast empire? Just how were they able to withstand the power of the Ruran, the might of their own liege, and expand so far into the west within less than a decade, at a time when neither mass transportation were available nor too many roads to ride and walk on? There are many reasons that we could factor in, but we need to realize that the Gök Turks' rise to power was not a result of foreign invasion. 
it was the result of a revolution from within. And in every revolution, there is a man with a vision. In this case, the man's name was Boomin. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to my channel. I also have a Patreon page where you can support me so I can make more videos like this one faster and within a shorter period of time. Oh, and there's also a book to be released very soon. In this book, I explain in detail the entire history of the first Gurkturk Empire from 546 to 630, including their Tengris religion, their customs, family values, daily lives and political topics like invasions, the civil war and their ultimate demise. You can pre-order the digital version already on Amazon. Anyway, see ya.